Hi students, in this lecture I want to give you just an overview of the first chapter of your textbook, the communication process, and just go over some key concepts with you. What is the definition of communication? Well, according to your textbook, it is not simply the process of transferring thought and ideas from one person to another. It's the process of people sharing thoughts, ideas, and feelings with each other in commonly understandable ways. In the basic model of communication, person A and person B, the sender and receiver, here called encoder, interpreter, decoder, and decoder, interpreter, encoder, both send and receive messages simultaneously. Stimulus and motivation are two requirements that trigger a sender to send a message. And the coding process explains these encoder and decoder labels here. Encoding is the process of putting a message into the form in which it is to be communicated, while decoding is the process the receiver goes through in trying to interpret the exact meaning of the message. Frames of reference are the background and experiences of both sender and receiver, and no two people, of course, have identical frames of reference. Everything we experience through our senses must pass through our frames of reference. Managers and employees have obviously different frames of reference. As messages progress up and down the levels of the organization, they are leveled, condensed, sharpened, assimilated, and embellished. Therefore, 100% communication is a communication fallacy. And so the effective communicator prepares for possible misunderstanding ahead of time. And this graphic shows a way that you can do that. You can identify the receiver's frame of reference, then shift the receiver's context by reframing the receiver's frame of reference. And so then the sender now conveys the content message, and the result is that the sender's message has a lot higher likelihood of acceptance because it can be understood by the receiver's frame of reference. The symbols that carry the messages are communicated through codes. So there are three basic communication codes, and they are language, which is the verbal code, and involves either spoken or written words. And then paralanguage is the vocal code. That involves the vocal elements that go along with the spoken language. Nonverbal is the visual code involved in all intentional and unintentional means other than the written or spoken word by which a person sends a message. So the codes must be consistent for effective communication. And people tend to believe what they see over what they hear when conflicting messages occur. So that's why our nonverbal communication becomes so important. A channel is the medium selected to carry the message. Channel richness is the amount of information a channel can convey. The more codes a channel carries, the higher its level of richness. Considerations for choosing a channel in the business setting are the importance of the message, the needs and abilities of the receiver, the amount and speech of the feedback required, the necessity of a permanent record, the cost of the channel, and the formality or informality desired. Memos and emails these days are often the channels of choice. Actually, memos we don't really even see as often as we used to. But Selection of words can affect the receiver's perception. Readers judge a company favorably when flexible sounding words are used in emails and unfavorably when strict sounding words are used. 
Feedback involves the verbal and visual response to a message. Feedback improves the accuracy and productivity of individuals and groups, and it increases employee satisfaction. Feedback also has disadvantages. It can cause people to feel under attack psychologically. It's time consuming. It can be difficult to elicit, and it's risky and may have resulted in negative past experiences. Some things to remember when receiving feedback. Tell people you want it. Identify which areas you want it in. Set aside time for regular feedback sessions. Use silence to encourage feedback. Watch for nonverbal responses. Ask questions. Paraphrase. Use statements that encourage feedback. Reward feedback and follow up. When giving feedback to others, direct it toward the behavior, not the person. Use descriptive, not evaluative language. Use it to share ideas, not give advice. Give only as much information as the person can take at one time. Give it immediately and at an appropriate time. Allow face saving when possible. And uh, the slide also has seven additional criteria for effective feedback that to some extent may overlap what I just went over. The communication environment includes the time, place, physical, and social surroundings in which the communicators find themselves. And noise is anything that interferes with communication by distorting or blocking the message. External noise includes distractions within the environment, and internal noise refers to conditions of the receiver. To sum up the chapter, effective communication is not easy. It's hard work. That's why we have a whole course dedicated to effective communication. Developing good communication skills can help ensure your success in the business setting. That is so true because the number one skill that employers seek is communication skills. Understanding the importance of ethical communication behavior can help you develop good communication skills. And I didn't really get into the specifics of ethics, but you'll find that in your textbook on page 22. Effective communicators are able to analyze communication problems and avoid the same mistakes in the future. And in this class, we'll be getting into some of those mistakes and problems and what can be done about them.